Iron's essential for life, but is the way you've been getting it damaging your health? It keeps your blood oxygenated, your brain functioning, and your muscles working. But could your source of iron be doing more than just nourishing you? I'm Callum Weir, your plant-based nutritionist, nutrition columnist, and host of Plant Fueled. Heme iron found in me is absorbed more easily, so much so that people see this as the superior form. On the other hand, non-heme iron, iron found in plants, is often dismissed as weaker. But when we look at the science, the question is which one isn't just absorbed better, but whether or not that absorption comes at a cost. Iron anemia deficiency isn't just a problem for a few, it's a global health crisis. According to the World Health Organization, the WHO, anemia affects around 40% of children under five, over 30% of women over reproductive age, and around 30 to 35% for men and women worldwide under 30. And the most common cause for this, iron deficiency. And while it's often framed as an issue for low-income countries, iron deficiency anemia still remains high, even in developed countries. And as usual, I will drop all the links to all the studies below. What's even more surprising is that the common belief that red meat is the best way to get iron, many people, especially meat eaters, still end up deficient. So why is this? Most discussions around iron really end up being around consumption. Eat steak, get iron. Without really questioning what happens after the iron enters the body. How much is absorbed and how much is actually used within our body's systems. And what are the potential downsides? And in this video, we're going to be breaking it all down. We're going to be looking into iron metabolism, comparing heme and non-heme iron, and what the latest research is about red meat. Is it truly a better source or is there a better way? Just because your body absorbs something faster, it doesn't mean it's better. When we usually talk about iron, we often hear that heme iron is superior, but it gets absorbed into the body more efficiently, often at rates of around 15 to 35%, in comparison to the 2 to 20% for non-heme iron. But what's rarely discussed is how our body regulates that iron. And this is where it starts to take an interesting turn. Iron is both essential and dangerous. It's a double-edged sword. The body needs iron for oxygen transportation, DNA synthesis, and energy production. But too much can be toxic, contributing to oxidative stress, inflammation, and even chronic disease. Unlike many other minerals, the body, the body has no active mechanisms to excrete excess iron. So it has to rely on one key defense mechanism, tight control over absorption. And that's where the biggest difference between heme iron and non-heme iron comes in. Non-heme iron absorption is regulated. Your body absorbs more when iron levels are low, and less when iron levels are sufficient. But heme iron bypasses this regulation, essentially enters the body whether you need it or not. And with that, is there consequences? Yes. Studies have linked high heme iron intake to increased risk of cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and certain types of cancer. A study published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition found that for every one milligram, in heme iron intake per day, the risk of coronary heart disease increased by 27%. And then when we look into another study on the European Journal of Nutrition, it suggested that high heme iron intake was associated with greater risk of type 2 diabetes, potentially due to iron-induced oxidative stress. So unlike water-soluble vitamins that we can flush out when we don't need them, iron accumulates. And when that happens, it doesn't just sit there harmlessly, unfortunately. It becomes a ticking time bomb, with those high iron levels being linked to heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and neurodegeneration. And this all comes down to how the body regulates iron. This comes down to a protein called ferritin, which acts as a storage holding facility for excess iron. So when ferritin levels climb higher, the higher iron levels cause oxidative stress, a process that damages cells, accelerates aging, and can fuel inflammation. And that's not just theory, it's backed by data. So this poses the question. It's not, are you getting the right iron? It's, are you getting enough of the right type? and in the right amounts. So if we step back and look at the big picture of long-term health, more iron isn't always better. So as we've mentioned, iron is normally framed as a single numbers game. The more you absorb, the better, but that's not how the body sees it. Unlike heme iron that's absorbed at a fixed rate, non-heme iron operates at a built-in regulatory system, a system that might be one of the most overlooked advantages of plant-based nutrition. So here's how it works. When the body needs iron, it increases absorption from non-heme sources. And then when levels are sufficient, absorption is then dialed down. This adaptive mechanism helps maintain balance, preventing both deficiency and excess. In contrast, heme iron bypasses these controls, meaning that even if your body doesn't necessarily need more iron, it will just absorb it anyway. And this difference has real world consequences. And then when we look at populations that mostly consume non-heme iron, while they do have lower overall iron stores, they also have lower rates of disease. This study found, while vegetarians and vegans had slightly lower ferritin levels than most meat eaters, they were still within a healthy range. And without the increased disease risk associated with excess iron storage. And also, and also this study here, 
suggested that lower iron levels might actually be protective, potentially reducing oxidative stress and inflammation. Non-heme iron does have a reputation problem. It's dismissed as inferior, but it's not absorbed as easily as heme iron. Well, also here's what people don't realize. The bioavailability isn't fixed, it's flexible. And with the right dietary strategies, you can significantly boost non-heme iron absorption, ensuring your body gets exactly what it needs without the risk of excess. And the best part about this is you don't need supplements for it or any kind of complex tricks. It's just a few simple food pairings that work with your body's natural regulation system. You have the power of vitamin C. The easiest and most effective way to increase non-heme iron absorption is by pairing it with vitamin C. Vitamin C can boost absorption by up to 300% by transforming iron into a form that's easy for the body to take in. Here's how that works in everyday meals. Iron-rich foods. Lentils, chickpeas, tofu, quinoa, leafy greens, spinach. Mixed out with your vitamin C boosters, so your red bell peppers, oranges, strawberries, tomatoes. These are simply combos that make a difference. So, you know, a chickpea curry, or a lemon dressing on your food, or a lentil dal with red peppers. A study published individuals who regularly paired plant protein iron sources with, with vitamin C rich foods had no increased risk of iron deficiency compared to those consuming heme iron. Then we need to look into your cooking and preparation methods. Beyond vitamin C, how could you prepare plant-based foods that can significantly impact iron absorption? So soaking and sprouting legumes and grains helps to break down compounds that can inhibit iron intake, making it more bioavailable. Then you've got fermentation like sourdough bread or tempeh, which naturally enhances nutrient absorption, reducing phytates, which can interfere with iron absorption. And then cooking foods like steaming spinach or sauteing kale reduces oxalates, another natural compound that can sometimes inhibit iron absorption. These simple tweaks make a big difference, allowing your body to extract more iron from the food you eat. Also timing matters. What to avoid around your iron rich meals. Just as some foods enhance iron absorption, others can reduce it when eaten at the same time. Tannins for instance. Tannins are found in coffee and tea caffeinated drinks. They can lower iron absorption if consumed with meals, but consuming them an hour before or an hour after makes a huge difference. Calcium can sometimes compete with iron absorption. High fiber foods are great for overall health, but consuming excess amounts in one sitting may slightly reduce iron absorption. The key balance is the bigger picture. It's not just the individual foods. But the bottom line, iron status isn't just about one single meal. It's about long-term dietary patterns. So people eating a variety of whole plant-based foods with vitamin C rich pairings naturally maintain healthy iron levels. Iron deficiency isn't more common in well-planned plant-based diets compared to omnivorous diets. What matters is the overall diet, not just the bio-individuality of a single meal. Doctors often use ferritin markers as a key indicator to iron status with higher levels being seen as a great sign of health. But is this actually true? Or have we been looking at ferritin completely the wrong way? So what does ferritin really tell us? Ferritin often used as a proxy for iron stores, but also what most people don't realize, is also an acute phase reactor. That means it rises in response to inflammation, infection, or even chronic disease, regardless of actual iron status. In other words, higher ferritin doesn't always mean healthy iron. It could be also be a sign that you're going through oxidative stress or chronic inflammation. With higher ferritin levels being linked to metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, and inflammation. And this was seen in people with and without iron overload. And research suggests that ferritin levels in between 30 to 100 nanograms is generally ideal for most people. With below 30 nanograms, there's an increased risk of iron deficiency, particularly in menstruating individuals. About 100 nanograms, there's a greater risk of oxidative stress and metabolic dysfunction, but there is suggestions between 50 and 70 nanograms may be the sweet spot for supporting iron needs without excess accumulation. In, interestingly, studies on long-lived populations, like those in more plant-based cultures, tend to show ferritin levels on the lower end of the spectrum. Now, could this be part of the reason for lower rates of chronic disease? One of the most common concerns about a plant-based diet is non-heme iron isn't that available. However, iron absorption can increase by up to 50% in individuals with lower iron stores, meaning that some plant-based eaters can naturally adapt to absorbing more iron over time. And in cultures where plant-based diets are more dominant, such as places like Asia and India, rates of iron deficiency anemia are often no higher than those in Western populations, despite overall lower iron intake, which suggests that iron bioavailability isn't as rigid as we once assumed. It's dynamic, changing on diet and need. There's also other upsides to this adaptive system. It helps prevent iron overload, which we know is linked to chronic disease. Non-heme iron absorption also slows down when our needs are met. Plant-based eaters also don't experience iron overload, even when eating iron-rich foods. And there's a natural control over iron absorption, 
which may contribute to lower rates of heart disease and metabolic disorders. So rather than seeing non-heme iron as a disadvantage, research suggested it does just allow the body to fine-tune iron absorption on its actual needs. I think at this point we've looked at both sides of the iron debate. We have broken down advantages and disadvantages, explored how non-heme iron is actually more regulated by the body. Plant-based iron is the smarter choice. Because the key advantage is, it isn't just that it provides enough, it's that it allows the body to regulate iron, absorbing what's needed while preventing excess accumulation. It's linked to better metabolic health and lower risk of chronic disease. A diet rich in iron from plants also contains an abundance of fiber, antioxidants, phytonutrients, vitamins, minerals, that supports overall and long-term health. Unlike heme iron, which is absorbed regardless of need, non-heme iron works with the body's natural feedback system. And let's not just forget the bigger picture. Our base sources come from foods that are good for our body good for, and benefits us in every way. So legumes, leafy greens, nuts, seeds, whole grains, and many, many more which have been consistently linked to longevity and disease prevention. So if you're eating a plant-based diet or considering shifting in that direction, the key takeaway is that you don't need heme iron to maintain great health. With the right approach, a plant-based diet can support energy, athletic performance, and longevity without the risk of excess iron. I'm Callum Weir. If you found this breakdown helpful, make sure to like and subscribe and turn on those notifications for more evidence-based nutrition. And for daily plant-based tips, head on over to Instagram at Plant Food Nutrition. I'll see you there. Until next time, peace and plants.